All right, good afternoon. Good five minutes afternoon, folks on the phone and folks here uh, gathered in Anchorage. We also understand there's a conference room of folks gathered in, uh, in Fairbanks for this presentation. So thanks for taking time out uh, on this wonderful Tuesday to hear a little bit about uh, a project that the Aleutian Bering Sea Islands LTC has been working on. Just in uh, kind of by way of intro, my name is Aaron Poe. I'm the coordinator for the Aleutian and Bering Sea Islands LCC. Uh, and a little tiny bit of background there. Uh, we are a public-private partnership. So we're uh, basically managed by a steering committee of about a dozen entities that includes tribes, includes NGOs, and a number of federal agencies um, that basically are trying to guide efforts that can solve for the common challenges that managers and communities have in the Aleutian and Bering Sea Islands region. So things like climate change impacts, things like certainly vessel traffic, which is what you're going to hear about today. We also work on invasive introduced species uh, as well as pollutants and contaminants. Um, so I think with that kind of short intro about the Lucian Bering Sea Islands LCC, uh, I would just mention that this, uh, this webinar series is held by LCCs, and uh, about every two weeks we have a presentation of this one. Uh, in fact, actually, you see if you're looking at the screen, the slides are flashing uh, coming up September 5th, Rob Bohannick with Axiom Data Science, who's one of our partners on some of the vessel traffic stuff. Uh, he's going to be presenting some work that they've done uh, recently, synthesizing a whole bunch of uh, ecological data um, in uh, Alaska's marine water. So that's one to kind of keep an eye out for. But today, uh, we're going to be hearing from Ben Matheson. So Ben Matheson is a kind of a rare combination of a GIS analyst slash uh, communications person. Uh, and so he works about half time uh, for Aleutian Bering Sea Islands LCC and about half time for the Northwest Boreal. And Ben is going to be presenting some work on uh, vessel drift analysis that we launched a couple of years ago uh, with a number of partners. And I think. Maybe just with one last reminder to have people put their phones on mute, please, so that we can all hear Ben. Um, we'll hand it off to him. And maybe even before I do that, I'm getting them nervous. Um, we, we do uh, kind of talk for about maybe 40 minutes or so. We'll, we'll see where the time will leave with us. But we're hoping to have good question and answer and some discussion afterwards. So Ben, take it away. Super. Well, thanks, Aaron. Um, again, my name is Ben Matt. I work with the FCLCC. And I will emphasize right away before I forget that this vessel drift analysis has been a collaboration among many partners, including the WCS Arctic Beringia program with Martin Robards, uh, partners at Gen West who developed this particle trajectory model, uh, Jerry Galtz and Ren Hansen, um, as well as some support from the Fish and Wildlife Service Refugees Program to, to the front, as well as my uh, partners here at the LCC. I'm not going to be too long today, so got a really solid group, and I'm looking forward to uh, some discussion afterwards. So lots of fun. And the more time that I've spent with this partnership um, across the Bering Sea, across the Aleutian Islands, uh, the more I realized that Alaska and the Bering Sea in particular really is the crossroads of the Pacific, the fastest, most direct path between Western North America and Asia goes through the Bering Sea. If you look up the jets, Find 30,000 feet above your head. They're on their way to some city in China. Uh, same thing goes for marine vessel traffic. Fastest path between ports on the west. Uh, literally, the world's largest economies: China, Japan, Korea. Pass through the Aleutians, through Unimac Pass, through some of the smaller passes. And we do have ships coming from all sorts of countries, all sorts of flags, Panamanian flagged vessels, uh, vessels flying or sailing under a Liberian flag. And if they don't stop in U.S. ports, they're sailing under innocent passage. As you know, they're not subject to uh, any U.S. regulations under, under that. And the traffic adds up over, over the year. If you've ever looked at the AIS data, the automatic identification system, the pings that uh, large vessels put off every few seconds or, or less, and uh, like I said, the, the vast majority of these transits, upwards of three to 5,000 per year through Unimac Pass, are uneventful. But every day there's nine to 12 vessels or, or thereabouts going through the choke point, um, in the words of Admiral Papp of Unimac Pass. The majority of these are completely uh, uneventful, but those edge case and worst case scenarios do occur, as many of you are familiar with. In 2004, 13 years ago, the Selendang IU going from Seattle to China with a load of soybeans, had a cracked cylinder, lost power, went to drift, 
Uh, the mechanics were unable to fully fix it. Towing efforts were unsuccessful and ultimately led to the deaths of six crew members, the vessel going aground on, on Alaska Island, and the loss of you know, some 60,000 tons of soybeans, 350,000 gallons of diesel and, and fuel. So we know that disabled vessels present a uh, risk for human life, for wildlife, for our communities, our economies. And in that context, our challenge here was to develop a spatially and seasonally understanding of the risks that disabled vessels present to both mariners and natural resources. And we want to kind of develop a, a geography of, of this risk across 16, 1,800 kilometers of the Aleutian chain. We did this using a particle trajectory model that can model um, extremely large amounts of, of data. And ultimately, instead of modeling oil, like the model that we used did, we modeled a disabled ship, ship that's drifting in the currents and blowing in the wind. Many of you have seen the AIS data and sort of the main routes that um, appear when you look across any, any period of time. Those four main routes are what we work with to uh, model this risk and to understand the drift patterns across the Bering Sea. There's the three main routes that go through Unimac Pass, cross the Bering Sea, and exit by Baldir or someplace north or someplace south. And then the sort of collection of routes that go south of the chain that uh, there, are, there are many routes that skirt the chain. Um, we have it sort of modeled into this one main route um, going across. And before I get too far into the weeds, um, let me just show you what, what it looks like when we're modeling these ships in winds and currents. So what this is showing is the release of 10,000 ships in the fall season from sort of the center of Unimac Pass, and we're seeing them drift north, drift south, drift onto shore, drift in circles, drift in strange ways. And we ultimately can understand um, how on the whole to understand the risk of a drifting ship and to understand uh, where some of these risks may lie for uh, natural resources like seabirds and stellar sea lions and uh, a number of other natural resources. Our partners at Gen West developed this particle trajectory model using uh, NOAA's GNOME model, the General NOAA Operational Modeling Environment. Amy, is that correct? So this is a, an open source particle trajectory model that's been around 20 years, and it allows for configuration. So instead of droplets of oil that are on the surface and weathering and changing, we, we being Gen West, configured this model so that we're modeling cargo ships and we're mod modeling tanker ships. So there's a vessel that's sticking above the water with more freeboard on the cargo vessel compared to the tanker that's sitting a bit lower. And then what we're going to do is act upon these particles with winds and currents. And we collected three years of winds and currents from research related to the Japanese tsunami um, back in 2011. So our sort of 2010 to 2013 space that we have this, this no model. We take our particle and we drop it at one of these many spots in the Bering Sea, and then we act upon it. Uh, first, we're going to use currents. These are from the Navy HICOM model, uh, global ocean model. And we act on it with the winds. These are satellite observed winds, the NOAA blended winds product. And because there's a lot of uncertainty and there's uh, a lot of randomness that occurs in these patterns, we introduce uncertainty into the wind vector. So within would be released many you know, tenths at a time, many times. And each of those particles is acted upon by currents and winds. Uh, this is obviously a very simplified model of vessel trajectories. Um, actual vessel drift has a lot to do with things like uh, the wave height and the wave periods and the keel depth and a ship quartering pattern that can be unique to different vessels. So it's obviously a, a simplified model to go about understanding ships in the Bering Sea. 
We did this several million times. We've got our four main routes with 21 sites across the four routes. We're going to model uh, actual currents and actual winds from four different seasons to understand the seasonality of how ships are going to behave. We're going to throw 250 different times within those seasons and throw 40 ships into the model um, at a time. Um, pretty quickly, that's over 3 million drift trajectories for each type of vessel. Um, again, this is the NOM model with help from GenWest and wind and currents from the Japanese uh, tsunami research. Um, ultimately, it ends up with a pretty, a pretty large data set, and this is kind of where, where I step in is to try to make sense of these hundreds of millions of records of, of the drifting ship. Before I, I go too far into where ships go and where, you know, it's really tempting to put dots on a map and look at where things end up, um, I do want to talk a little bit about, about when, about what type of time scales may be important and uh, what type of time scales uh, are certainly on my mind as I try to understand this risk. Um, as many of you know, the resources for response across the Bering Sea are limited and there's a large kind of centralization of that in Dutch Harbor. And against context, um, this is a graphic from Research's recent reports back in December that looks at uh, fair and seed risk analysis, uh, very, very good report that I, I certainly recommend. Uh, this was something also that was uh, addressed in the Aleutian Islands Risk Assessment when you're talking about tugs of opportunity. If you have an incident that's not near Dutch Harbor or not near ADAC, um, one of the responses that is called upon frequently is the, the tugs of opportunity, the vessels that are out there doing work. And the Tor Viking II is a, a case study in this. This was a vessel that Shell had hired during the uh, 2010 season, I believe. There was a ship, the Golden Seas, carrying canola beans that made a drift. Uh, this poor Viking was batched to go assist, um, but fortunately the, the vessel was far enough offshore that there were no major issues with the drift. The vessel was able to uh, restart, but this uh, vessel of opportunity is one of those, those cases that uh, we're going to look at with risk analysis. Now, the Aleutian Islands Risk Assessment did an estimate on the times that it's going to take based on vessels that are active in the Bering Sea region during the summer and looked at some of those sample times. So if you've got an incident in this uh, study time period that's occurring at ATU in Sea State 4, uh, the median response time is 70 hours. If you get uh, bad weather and are up to Sea State 6, it's 148 hours for the median response time for a vessel that's able to assist uh, a, a large vessel that would be under distress. Um, with ADAC, you're looking at 40 hours, C state four and in 90 hours um, at C state six. So the, the range obviously is rather large. If you've got um, an incident that's very close to Dutch Harbor, your response time is going to be small, but those uh, response times can get very, very long in uh, bad weather, in remote conditions. And we did this uh, analysis out to seven days. And for those familiar with the region, the Weather conditions can be rather rather terrible, and several efforts to uh, respond and prevent casualties uh, do not work in uh, weather conditions. Um, emergency towing tends to emerge as one of the more viable options, as you've got uh, the availability to do that in most of the time, 98% under the Aleutian Island Risk Assessments analysis. So that's that we can start to look at times and start to look at, in this analysis, where things, where things panned out. So from left to right, I've got the four routes um, with 21 sites across each of them. And on this line graph on the top, I'm showing the percentage of vessels that went aground um, across these different time periods. So day one, you can see on the furthest right side, the furthest east, if you release in Unimac Pass, there's uh, some 33% of wind aground um, after one day. 
the sites that are further from land that are spaced out across the Bering Sea have much uh, lower percentages. And then you do see a little spike here by, uh, by Atu, so that blue line there. Um, after three days, we see the numbers um, naturally go up. You've got north of 40% that have gone adrift after uh, these three days. Um, again, in the central Aleutians, where you have lots of space, the, the numbers are relatively small. But you do start to see on route for the ships that skirt the Aleutian chain, um, you are starting to see 10 to 20 percent of ground after three days. Um, and again, after seven days, those patterns become a bit more stark. We can start to look at seasonal patterns as well as we release ships at all sorts of different times across all different seasons and recorded those, those release times. The colors you see, the winter is purple, spring is green. Um, you start to see different, different patterns on the beachings for different seasons. So uh, winter and fall tend to rise to the top. You've got you know, north of 60% in the fall time that are beached uh, here at Unimac Pass, while spring and summer it's closer to 40 for this analysis. And it becomes, again, more, more stark and a bit more clear after seven days of analyzing this. Fall and winter tend to be, have more active winds and more movements of the vessels, and you see correspondingly more, more beachings. A very rough look at the distribution across seasons, you will see different, different patterns. Uh, things are, um, again, they're, they're all focused on this release site around on Alaska Island and nearby, but uh, that pattern became very clear under the simulation. What I've done with the output of this data is start to sort of quantify grid cells of where ships uh, tend to collect on the beach. There are, uh, I think there's three million points collected in this, this raster. And you can see that these red areas across these four routes, that quite a few of them just sort of stay out at shore and stay somewhere close to where those original patterns were. But we're a bit more interested now in looking at where the vessels went uh, aground and sort of identifying some of the spots of shoreline that could be more vulnerable um, across that. I am trying to keep myself grounded in reality as I'm, as I'm doing this. And I haven't dug up all of the drift trajectories, but I do want to find those. But I did look at the Taldang IU's rough drift trajectory as it went um, past Bogosloff Island and ultimately down towards Unalaska. And I looked at when I release, when this model releases ships from that approximate location, uh, where do they drift to in uh, December time? And I took a bit of a closer look at Unalaska, and then you can sure enough identify the spots where ships tend to collect a little bit more in these, these cells. Uh, Spray Cape here is where the Sondang IU went to ground and, and broke up some 13 years ago. From here, we've got uh, lots, of, lots of chances to do, to ask some pretty interesting questions. We can ask about natural resource vulnerability with stellar sea lion colonies, with bird colonies. We can ask about safety from the mariner's perspective if you're making decisions about vessel routing um, at different times of year, at, uh, in different types of conditions, uh, you're not going to have really specific answers that are going to be used in an operational, tactical, actual response. You're going to have a completely, set of, completely different set of information and tools for that response. But as you go about studying risk and studying patterns and developing policies for uh, vessel routing, among other things, you can do that. And for those who are managing risk on the ground, uh, you can perhaps begin to identify some hot spots that uh, may not have come up in, in the past. We do get a lot of these, a lot of variation in where ships end up, but I do want to show kind of a, a sample of how this fits into stellar sea lions as they're an endangered species and 
tend to be active in many of the same regions that large amounts of vessel traffic uh, occur. In a really basic sense, what we can do is we can find the location of where stellar sea lions fall out and where they have their colonies and where they're active. And we can see over the course of a season, over the course of uh, the entire year, um, we can see whether those are regions that would tend to collect more ships under this model environment. Um, and sure enough, you, you are going to find that stellar sea lions um, find themselves in many of the cells that collected quite a few ships under this analysis. Uh, these green cells are sort of the, the densest cells. These are, these are where the most ships under this kind of annual simulation ended up. And you do have sites. I don't have uh, the information to know how active or how populated or how important these particular sites are, but you can pretty quickly see that there are uh, there's activity in places where ships may be going ashore. Uh, look out west towards the Delaroff Islands, and you can look with as, as much granularity as you would like to about uh, which colonies may be at risk and which ones uh, perhaps may not be at risk. We can begin to do the same thing for bird colonies. This is uh, crested auklets. Uh, this is data thanks to Rob Kaler from Fish and Wildlife Service Migratory Birds. And again, you can do the same types of operations. This is just the most basic operation where uh, you count the number of ships that end up in cells in which uh, these bird colonies exist. Uh, I do want to point out, too, that uh, Martin Renner and Kathy Kulitz have done some excellent work in this exact area, modeling uh, risk to seabirds, where you're taking densities of traffic and densities of bird populations to uh, identify those hotspots where um, birds may face uh, more exposure to risk. They ultimately came out with a lot of similar patterns that we did, where Unimac Pass, where you've got most traffic, you also happen to have a lot of uh, very important bird habitat. We are close to being able to share all this out and have it go off into the world. Uh, these are a few of the data products that um, I'm expecting to have come out and uh, would love to have some ideas too about what you think would be useful or what um, types of analyses that all of you may be interested in, in doing. But basically gives everyone a chance to address the time aspect, whether you've got one day to respond, three days to respond, seven days to respond, uh, the different vessel types. If you want to look at cargo ships more so than tanker ships, you can do that. And the seasonal question as well, uh, these are broken down into spring, summer, fall, and winter. Um, we'll also be doing some of the seabirds um, intersections and being able to to share that bit out here. Um, before we move on to a bit of a discussion, I want to share just a, a bit more about what the APSI partnership has done in terms of trying to understand vessel traffic and uh, share some of this data that already is accessible and, and may be useful. Um, we've used AIS information to, uh, like, like others, try to characterize the traffic across the Bering Sea, um, count the transits through you know, Baldir Pass and through Attu, through um, this southern route. So we do get a sense that there's more vessels that are going westbound through Unimac Pass. Um, something like, yeah, two-thirds uh, tend to be going westbound, whereas the southern route sees more eastbound traffic. Um, one of the patterns that we've observed, among others. And many of you are, are are familiar with the sort of sneak pit spaghetti of AIS data that, that comes out. And to understand sort of the, the network effects and to understand the traffic in a more simplified manner, we, along with partners, developed a more simplified network of this, this pattern so that we could both understand what's happening today and then also look at projections when the CMTS says that we're going to see 
uh, so much of a percent of increase by 2025. Um, we can do this. We can understand what that what that looks like, and we can also take that to partners like Coeric, who bring about some really good questions. And uh, Aaron's been very active in uh, soliciting feedback and, and questions from the uh, Coeric group. Um, in particular, what we can do once we understand this network in a sort of line and node and edge format is develop this baseline uh, picture of what it looks like using agent-based models, which I'm not going to speak to. But we can also then look ahead to 2025 and have really good conversations with people about uh, what it looks like in particular regions around the Barents Straits, around Northern Sound, around uh, St. Lawrence Island. And so we did take these, these projections looking at the 2025 uh, Committee on Marine Transport um, projections where you've got uh, baselines and you've got highs and lows. Um, and then we can take that information and figure out when it's going to occur, especially as we're, I'm thinking more up, up north here as uh, we do see more increased traffic through the Bering Strait and more um, Arctic activity in general. And you can take that and have great conversations with uh, queer folks and other and ask about if we're missing certain species interactions, if we're missing certain times of year, if there's locations where there's um, particular amounts of subsistence activity that may not be getting the attention. And the direction that I believe this is headed is, is one that includes capturing the, the sound footprint of ships as well. So in, in Boston Harbor, they've, they've done this with whales and with ships there. Once you've got the, the sound profile of a type of a ship, you can sort of understand how long it's spending in regions where marine mammals are active, uh, how close this sound print, sound print gets to uh, different species and kind of what it looks like and how you can have those conversations with uh, all of those folks here. Um, again, this has been a, a super collaborative project between uh, Gen West, between the Arctic Beringia Program, between the LCC, and uh, lots of other folks that have helped us along the way. That's about as much as, as I have, but I know we've got a really solid group of people here, and uh, I would love to answer questions or get some feedback or uh, really just take this where we can take it. And actually, Ben, maybe maybe this is Aaron. So again, maybe before you do that, I just want to emphasize a little bit on the, that part of that piece so that folks understand that that first, I think you mentioned it, but I'm just going to emphasize it. The, in terms of vessel drifts up in the Illusions, that was funded by Fish and Wildlife Service Refuges Program. And their particular interest was those bird colonies and trying to understand which colonies do we want to make sure we have really tight kind of numbers on in, in case there is some kind of incident. Um, was kind of a risk of that. Um, that last piece that he talked about, kind of ongoing work with the, the National Park Service actually paid for that. They were interested in being responsive to Bering Strait Native communities' concerns about increased amount of vessel traffic um, through the region. So it's uh, Tave Jones is the, the person leading that work, but we're certainly a collaborator. And again, I think a lot of the question developments around that were in active um, discussions with Coeric, uh, the regional Native Association up in the Bering Strait. So just those little kind of pieces. Um, I, and I have an exciting uh, thing. Somebody just texted me. Apparently, we broke the limit on the number of people trying to watch our yeah. webinar event. So you just blasted through all records. We broke the internet. Uh, we broke the internet today. Yeah. So congratulations <laughs> for yeah. that. Um, so I, and maybe just to point a serious note, this is actually being recorded so we can follow up with folks and they can check out a recording of this. So yeah, something like people were texting me saying, I can't get in. Uh, but anyhow, so we have probably at least 50 folks on the phone, I think, is what that means. So this could be a little bit chaotic, but um, maybe I'll just try and open it up to any questions on the phone first. Yeah, this is uh, Doug Helton from NOAA. I, I right, was Doug. wondering if uh, you mentioned the increase in tanker traffic through the Bering Strait. Do you have any idea where those tankers are originating and, and heading to in that projection? I would point you to the NUCA research Bering Sea vessel risk analysis that uh, looks exactly at, at that question. But I believe tankers that go through the Bering Strait, uh, a really large portion of them are going to serve the Red Dog Mine, um, sort of an outsized 
portion are involved with that. Um, I know AIS data is going to show a lot of tanker activity on the Russian side, but um, that's as far as I can speak to that question. And Doug, this is Aaron. I, I'd also point you to that, so that CMTS 2015 report, if you're talking about projected future numbers, there's an analysis of where they think those tankers and why some of the diversions might be happening worldwide. Okay, thanks. Any, anyone else out there since that went so smoothly? Yeah, yeah, please, Judy. I would, Hicks. And, and I didn't mention, but please introduce yourself so that folks can understand who's, who's talking. Okay. And Aaron, I've also had a polite request for you to talk a little bit slower. Oh, okay. Hi, this is the last response company. Um, I was just, Doug just asked a question about the tanker traffic, which also really surprised me on the CMTS analysis, but I didn't see any baseline. And I was a little confused during the presentation. You used the term tanker as opposed to container ship, the high profile versus low, but do you actually mean bulker? Because there's not very much tanker traffic. I guess the, the model was configured for a ship that's got a lot of freeboard and one that's got less. So I may have mixed up the terms where I'm keeping cargo or container, but uh, one with more freeboard and one that's Okay, maybe to make yeah. it clear, just a suggestion. If you if you just go through and look at where you've used the term tanker, and perhaps you really mean bulker, yeah. it would it would help me understand your data a little bit better. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions on the phone or comments or ideas? This is John Kaltenstein from Friends of the Earth. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead, John. Well, thanks for doing this, first of all, and everyone involved, including Ben, for the presentation. I had kind of a, a policy-related question. I know, uh, obviously, in light of all the traffic, there was a decision made and a lot of parties involved in the IRA process to put forth some recommendations, one of which was the areas to be avoided, uh, which were implemented a little while ago. Does this work that you're doing, does this, could you recommend perhaps other relevant policy-related recommendations that um, this research shed some lights on, sheds light on in terms of going forward with that in order to provide more protection for the region? I would love to open that up to anyone who works with <laughs> policy in the And actually, John, this is, this is Aaron. Oh, I'll, I'll try a possible answer for that. And so, um, I'm serving on the, uh, there's a convening work group for an Aleutian Islands Waterway Safety Committee that right. is being stood up this fall. And so one of the things I'm hopeful that that committee would be willing to look at is, is the results of this kind of work to see if there are implications that, you know, could identify, if, you know, the, the way that committee is more like sort of recommendation space, so not explicit policy, but sort of like best management practices. Right, um, okay. So that's one way that I'm hopeful this, this information could be useful. Great, and thank you. Aaron, this is Martin. Can I just jump in on that? Yeah, please, Martin. Yeah, one of the things, John, that came out on this was, you know, there being so much focus on Unimac Pass and then the Western Aleutians around Attu um, that, you know, for us, you know, the southern route really sort of shone out, you know, in this analysis. And certainly the number of vessels there, the number of vessels in the winter, and, you know, they're in pretty close proximity to the Aleutian chain for a pretty large part of their voyage as that sort of upward arc, you know, comes along the southern Aleutians. And so I think that would be a policy piece that maybe needs some looking at, you know, outside of the focus we have on those two passes. Great. Great. Thank you. And then just so folks, that's Martin Robards with Wildlife Conservation Society, so one of the co-authors for this work. So thanks, Martin. question on policies, talking about um, new possible policies. <clears throat> How about policies for the shippers themselves going through the insurance companies? Because a lot of what happens out there, as Judy knows this as well, is usually a combination of things, whether it's mechanical failure and weather patterns, and almost always it is combined with maybe poor decisions by the master or by the chief engineer. Um, some of the things that they have done in the past, you know, Phil and Deng IU, they were doing maintenance. They shut down to do maintenance. 
and um, couldn't get their engine started again. Um, poor decisions. Some of that you'll see on the AIS. There's a ship container ship outside the United Passes doing all sorts of donuts. Right? Yeah, taking the scenic route. You've called, yeah. You, yeah, Coast Guard now calls and says, what are you doing? Right. And it's amazing how they just straighten up and go through. But it's, it's scheduling as well. So these, these go back to um, corporate decisions that are made, uh, whether it's in Bremen or whether it's in you know, Tokyo or Japan. If they want that vessel to back off on their time a little bit, the vessel captain doesn't want to come into a port because then he's got to pay. He's got to pay costs to go into it. So that's why they do a lot of that kind of running around um, force majeure. Um, if they don't like the weather, they see something coming up that makes them uncomfortable, they'll often just find a place to hide. They'll just pick a place to hide and go in. And they don't know what the sea state's going to be in there, what the bottom's like, if there's good anchorage. But they've got resources right there in the region. They've got the Alaska Marine pilots who know, know more about these waters all the way up to Red Dog than anybody, anybody on the planet. Um, and maybe ways to get to them for you know, going back to best practices. Force them to do that, but right. And I think, but thank you, Shirley. That, and I think that's exactly the kinds of conversations we're hoping can happen in that waterway safety committee. So Alaska Marine Pilots is on that convening work group as well. And so I think it's a lot of this kind of voluntary and, you know, basically kind of education back and forth. That you know we can share out where are these you know safe places or where are some of these high risk places. Um, but hopefully this work can help with some of that conversation too. There are uh, four words in the. Alternative planning criteria from the Alaska Maritime Prevention and Response Network that summarizes all of these millions of calculations that were done here. Uh, simply says distance offshore buys time. So I think the, those, those questions about routing um, can find themselves in the planning criteria and lots, lots of places like that. Right. And, and they have, um, you know, now 50 miles right. uh, required. But on that, you know, kind of have to be careful too that um, arbitrarily, and I'm not saying that that happened, I think it was well thought out, but when somebody says, you know, we should get them, kick them 100 miles out, you may be putting them in a far worse sea state, in a far worse area that, you know, if they have then a mechanical problem. So, it, you know, it really has to be tempered with response, right? um, education and response. And then I had just a quick question about when you were looking at your tugs of opportunity. And it said other, and I'm assuming did you have the, the local full-time tug station in Dutch Harbor as, as part of that for response? Uh, it was that map from the. I think this is from the Aleutian Islands Risk Assessment. So I'm. I think it called out the Result Pioneer, didn't it? It said Result it, Pioneer and Alex Haley. It did break it down into yeah, all the islands. No, I saw those. Maybe it's in front of the all other tugs, or well, and so the question being also is that is that from a departure? If you're talking Alex Haley, it's obvious for the resolve and it would probably be from Dutch Harbor because that's her birth. But the Coast Guard, uh, not all of their cutters can tow because they've been reconfigured for helos. Number one and number two, they're on tour. You have no idea where they're going to be at any given time. So I'm just wondering if that's kind of factored in. And then back to the tugs uh, in Dutch Harbor proper, those those have responded in the past, and you've got a tug now there with 6,000 more than 120 pounds of baller beyond the, the Resolve Pioneer. Um, that's their burst full time. So I, I was just curious if, if um, you'd looked at any of those in terms of response. Me personally, I did not uh, look at the current vessels in Dutch Harbor, but the way the folks doing the risk assessment looked at this was they Throughout the course of the summer, they captured where Alex Haley and where Resolve Pioneer were, and they uh, averaged that out um, throughout the course of the summer. So these are median response times. So sometimes Alex Haley would be way, way off doing patrol someplace, sometimes Pioneer would be nearby. Um, but that, this, for me, this was a way of, to think about some of these median times and possible response times, but the granularity of was this is Doug Helton again was the assumption that if the vessel the assist vessel could get there that it could could take some positive action or 
because the getting there is only part of the challenge. Right. Yeah, I think that is the assumption that they're making in this work, Doug. Yeah. Then are you familiar with the Laura Maersk a month ago? No. Okay, that, that might be something that you'd be really interested in. She was a fully loaded container ship on the way she was coming. I think she was going westbound. She'd just gone through uh, Unimac Pass, and she lost all of her power. She had steering, but she had no power. And um, she was not far off Accutan, right off Accutan. And they called, and it was a Millennium Falcon um, that went out, and the Gretchen Dunlap went out with emergency towing system. And it was kind of funny. I mean, they were thinking out of the box, but they're trained to do that. And the first guys that got out there with the Millennium, he didn't have the emergency towing system. That was coming on the Gretchen. But he realized what he could do since the captain had steerage. He put his nose right on the stern of the container ship and said, I'll push you steer. <laughs> they went out another, I think, another 30 miles out, um, getting the Gretchen time to get there. But by the time things started getting between them, this comes back, I think, to policy and process with the, with the Coast Guard and with the respondents. The time that the Coast Guard... Captain of Port Anchorage is talking to Juno. Nobody's talking to Dutch. The agent's right. talking to the ship who's not talking to the Coast Guard who's not talking to Dutch. And they chewed up four hours. Thank God it was summer because right. you wouldn't have had those four hours in the winter. So I'm just, that might be, I mean, that's perfect. It's just there made for you yeah. to look and see how she yeah, drifted. And, and, um, and again, it was, you know, it was a local, it was a kind of opportunity. <laughs> Any other questions, comments, thoughts out there, either from kind of the group that's in Fairbanks or else just folks on the phone? This is Martin again real quick. Um, just thankful for those last few comments. I mean, I think this project came about from the sort of serendipity of the NOAA folk redoing the GNOME sort of base model, and so we sort of tied into that with having the vessel drift in there. Um, but also with the Japanese tsunami um, providing some better data to sort of drive these models. Um, but it's great that we're coming up with these ideas of how this might be used. So, you know, you know this data is going to be put online for everybody to use um, forthwith. So a big thank you to Ben for getting this done. It was a pile of data to drop in his lap. people go to their lunches. Could you just clarify one more question? Judy Miller, again, Alaska Response Company. You used the term release early on in the presentation several times, and then I was a little confused where you shifted to actual groundings or beaching. I wasn't sure in some of the data if I was seeing okay. dots of vessels or something released. I should have said pseudo ships. So it was pretty much all simulated. So the word release meant a ship running aground somewhere, not I, – I, the word release just made me immediately think of Bill, and I maybe oh. was wrong. So I, I'm trying to make sure I understand the big picture. It should be just about all simulated, simulated releases. Uh, what does that mean? The, of compute of – So releases where you put a boat in the water and said you're dead. Boat. A right. drift it's pattern. A, it's a boat. It's yeah. a big boat. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Release has nothing to do with that oil. Okay. Yep. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> 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 or a vessel. <laughs> and this is Shirley. And one last thing, um, more information that might help you. You have a tremendous amount of data to put in. But if you can go back and look at the Selandang IU tracks, the Salico Frigo tracks, the Golden Seas tracks, um, the tracks of uh, Laura Maersk, you'll get absolute real time because they all happened in different points of the year, and, you know, um, and you can see exactly how they behave. Yeah, that's a great point. And two were Volkers, like Judy made a point. That, that is a good consideration, tankers and Volkers, they do, they do handle differently. Which I think, I think Ben actually was modeling Volkers, which is the majority of the traffic, but you just, the term to you in your mind, you were just using the term tanker, meaning something that's below the water as opposed to a high profile above the water. So it's not a, it's not a hard correction, I don't think, for his. Except that I think also when you're talking 2025, if you're talking tankers, then I think you are looking at LNG tankers coming out of Yamal and out of Russia. I, yeah, I don't know what that so, CMTS so is. So the future, 
if it's a future look, I, I think they'll be there. But primarily now it is the bolt carriers that are doing the Arctic from you know, Canada and Norway to Russia that they're talking about bringing down to the Straits. Well, and also also a large percentage of the traffic to North America, U.S. West Coast, are bulkers. And very few, very few are tankers. Right. So that's why the whole thing kind of, I just want to think your data is still really good because you're just differentiating me. The ones below and the ones above the water, fine. Just don't use the word tanker. <laughs> <laughs> tanker. Yeah. Um, this is uh, oh. Sean Bob Kelly with NOAA. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, maybe speak up a little bit, Sean Bob, though. Okay. Yeah, this is Sean Bob Kelly. Uh, one thing I might note, I was just down in Vancouver earlier, is that, uh, you know, they do, they have one tanker go to Asia about every week right now, and they just completed the. Uh, the Trans Mountain Pipeline to bring a lot of that dillbit oil over from the tar sands, and they're expecting that to go up from one tanker a week to seven tankers a week. So that's a pretty large increase, and that's probably going to go online next year. So that's some increased tanker traffic to Asia from Vancouver. So, and those are oil tankers. Too. Gotcha. Thanks, Sean Bob. Anything else, folks? Last thoughts? Definitely appreciate every The room is packed. It's really hot here in Anchorage, actually. Uh, I think we should all go outside. Um, but definitely appreciate folks chiming in. As I said, this is recorded, um, so contact one of us. You have uh, definitely at least Brett Park's information. It's on the flyer and everything that got sent around. So we're happy to pass on a recording or a copy of the presentation if that's helpful. Um, and then stay tuned, I suppose, uh, for those of you interested in this kind of uh, synthesis effort that uh, Axiom Data Science is going to present on September 5th. And maybe just because it's what people do, a round of applause for Ben. Right. <laughs>